What's up, guys? It's the Blue Bloods. We're coming back at you with another ACC in 28 Days episode. This time, we're joined by the voice of the Virginia Tech Hokies, John Laser, who is also a writer for Inside Hokies Sports Magazine. And I just want to say, man, I appreciate you joining me. Absolutely, Zach. It's my pleasure. For sure. So let's start with this season, man. I mean, the Hokies finished five and six, but I, I think this might have been one of the teams impacted most by COVID, especially to start the season. Did this season meet, exceed, or fall short of your preseason expectations? Yeah, it's a complex question, and it's a good one, Zach, and I'm happy that you asked it. In terms of COVID, obviously, COVID has wreaked havoc on everybody, and everybody, not just in athletics, clearly has been negatively impacted. A lot of people, a lot worse than football implications. But to your point, the timing and the manner in which that it hit this Virginia Tech program, I think, couldn't have been worse in terms of their progress and momentum going into the season than ultimately what they were able to do, because I don't think Justin Fuente would wait too long to tell you that that was easily the most talented roster that he's had on both sides of the ball, the most complete team that he had going into the season, but you wind up having to postpone your first game. Then you play your actual first game against NC State, minus 26 players or whatever it was. Then you get ravaged on the defensive side, coaches and players. You miraculously beat Duke, and you know how fan bases are. The expectations are higher than they should be due to the reality of where the roster was, and on it went, and, and you just got eviscerated from a depth standpoint through a variety of issues before you got to the harder portion of your schedule. And, you know, I think that beating Virginia in the fashion that Virginia Tech did took a little of the sting out of the season. We'd all be lying if we didn't say that it wasn't a bit disappointing, but at the same time, you go back to the expectation of what the season was supposed to be. Marquee showdown with Penn State, non-conference at a sold-out lane stadium. Uh, your schedule that you were supposed to play was a lot more favorable than the one that you ultimately did play. So uh, I'm glad that Whit Babcock has made the decision to press forward with the Justin Fuente era. I really felt it would have been uh, unfair to judge him and his staff off last year. But yeah, it was a missed opportunity. And unfortunately, like so many things, uh, the virus was the primary culprit. Right. And, you know, we covered a lot of Virginia Tech games this year on the podcast just because of what, like you said, what Virginia Tech was supposed to be. The ACC was talented from top to bottom this year, I feel like, with a lot of underrated teams. But there was a player, Kansas transfer Khalil Herbert, that just probably was one of the best running backs, I would say, in the entire country. Averaged almost eight yards per carry, was a real staple in carrying this offense throughout the season. What was it about Herbert that made him so successful this year in this offense? Well, first things first, this was easily the best offensive line that Virginia Tech has had since I've been here, which is now six seasons. And I think that probably actually stretches back at least a decade. So he would be the first to acknowledge that he had a lot of great running lanes. But I think the thing that allowed Khalil Herbert to be so successful is his patience. You often saw him waiting behind that lane, that line and allowing them to create those holes and create those running lanes. And it was his vision off that patience. And then he's faster than most people thought, including myself going into the season. I didn't think he was a plotter by any means, but I certainly didn't think he was a speedster that could run away from people. So it's the combination of experience and the patience that comes with probably waiting behind a Kansas line, all joking aside, that didn't open up too many holes for him and uh, waiting in vain for those holes that never came. So uh, it was a combination of things, but I think the biggest thing is he's a worker, clearly, uh, sat behind a guy that had a lot of success at Kansas on teams that didn't have a lot of success. I, I know that he really welcomed his opportunity here and did all of the work to gain all of the reps. And honestly, in an unbiased opinion, I think he's going to be an exceptional NFL back because he is versatile. I don't think you saw his true capability as a pass catcher. He's got great hands as well. You didn't have to use him in that sense because he was so successful in a traditional manner. Uh, so he's the full package, honestly, who was just kind of overshadowed because of where he originally chose to play. Right. And I think you saw that even with Puka Williams this year ended up transferring Puka. from Kansas. Yeah. All, he's a very talented guy. I'm up here at Kansas State right now. I saw him play last year. He ran for like 200 on K-State a few years back with no help. So those Kansas backs are turning into something. But I want to move to the quarterback position, most important. Hendon Hooker played this year. He's now transferred out of Virginia Tech. 
But uh, the Justin Fuente and the staff seem to be very high on Braxton Burmeister. He's to project a starter as of now from what I've been reading. What do you think about Burmeister's potential and how big of a loss is Hendon Hooker for this team? He's a loss in terms of depth. Uh, I think if you injected Coach Fuente with truth serum, which I'm actually able to do behind the scenes quite a bit, <laughs> I think that he believed Braxton Burmeister was the most complete quarterback on the roster last year. And you saw some of the limitations. Quincy Patterson is an exceptional athlete, uh, but the accuracy just wasn't there in terms of your downfield aerial attack. And despite your efforts at developing him, those hadn't come along to the point where he could help you win consistently. You could see him help us win in flashes, never more so famously than the six overtime game against North Carolina. For Hendon Hooker, uh, it was health issues that held him back at the beginning of the season, never really was in shape. And then I think at times mentally throughout the course of the season, he just got shaken for whatever the reason being. And after that initial surge where he was 6-0 and as a starter, I think he went 2-6. and as a starter the rest of the way. So honestly, it clears the way, I think, in a good way to allow Braxton Burmeister to be the alpha. I think a program needs that. I see it right now in the weight room with him. You can't tell by my physique, but I actually spend a little time in there. And uh, you can see that Braxton is the guy that people look to. And I think that's been difficult in years past because you've always had a little bit of depth. So there's always been some of that competition going in and guys aren't focused on leading the team because they're focused on winning the job. And that won't be the case this year, which is great. But I'd also be lying if I said that Hendon is not a remarkably gifted athlete who's going to have success at Tennessee, uh, would have had success if he remained the starter here. He's an awesome kid. Uh, so his loss is definitely a loss, particularly if something happens to Braxton Burmeister. This program is fine uh, in terms of, of where they are in the position if, and that's a big if, Braxton Burmeister stays healthy. And that's why you see them go get a guy like Connor Blumrick, uh, the transfer from Texas A&M. Right. And, uh, you know, you talk about Justin Fuente and what he's done here. And, like, he's so confident in Burmeister and everything. I want to talk just about him. He takes the head coaching job in 16 after turning Memphis into what it is today, a powerhouse in the AAC. And he won the ACC Coastal his first year, made four consecutive bowl games until this year. What do you think has made him so successful here? And do you think he's on the path to bringing Virginia Tech to, to the heights that we saw you know, in the early 2000s and stuff like that? Well, it's interesting because I think the game has changed so much and athletics have changed so much since Virginia Tech was at those heights consistently, you know, had one legitimate chance at national championship, maybe one and a half. Uh, if you count Michael Vick's second year, where unfortunately he had the ankle injury and that team may have advanced to the playoff, given that that they would have been had had a little apology in terms of or a little grace in terms of that injury. But throughout that, it was a very solid program that was winning 10 games against the conference conference at the time, once in 2004, you went to the ACC, that gave you probably a handful at least of gifted wins along right. the way. So I think what has allowed Justin Fuente to have success is he's a, re he's a realist. I don't think he came into Blacksburg in awe of that era of Virginia Tech football. I think he came in as a guy that was very confident in his process, what he learned from Gary Patterson, what he had learned from other coaches along the way, what he had done at Memphis, which is essentially taking the poorest program in the country in a lot of ways and turning it, as you said, into a perennial winner, at least in the group of five rank. And I think he also made an honest assessment of what Virginia Tech was, which was what he got here, an outdated program. You could just walk the halls and the facilities and see that Virginia Tech was markedly behind other programs. And I think ultimately, whether his legacy is a lengthy one here in Blacksburg or not, he's going to be remembered as the guy that modernized this program and brought it into the 21st century in terms of the digital age and how you recruit and how you keep up uh, with some of the other programs from a resource standpoint. So he's a young guy. He still is a young guy. Him and I are about the same age. So I can say that liking to think that I'm a young guy still in my 40s. And uh, yeah, some of that success is because of the staff that he's had and the coordinators, including Brad Cornelson, he's brought with him. But most of it has to do with his experience and the fact that he is a very brilliant football mind, particularly on the offensive side. Right. And I think you see that the Virginia Tech offense has been exceptional under him. But National Signing Day for the 2021 class just wrapped up. And 
we saw a huge improvement for Virginia Tech on the recruiting trail, getting some very, very nice recruits. That class was one of, I guess, one of the tops in the ACC top half. And the thing about this class is I saw impact transfers from other schools. They had a top three JUCO prospect. They had talented high school seniors from around the country. There were recruits all the way from Virginia to California in this class. What are your thoughts on how Virginia Tech recruiting is looking? And in your opinion, what were the biggest needs that this team needed to fill? Well, I think that the recruiting world as a whole has been a little bit slow to adapt, one, to the early signing day, and we don't have the pomp and circumstance that we used to have on National Signing Day, and two, to the fact that it's become a more NFL model in terms of roster construction, where you look at the transfer portal, I just call them free agents. You're making veteran free agent signings rather than drafting guys, if you're looking at it from that NFL lens. And I think Justin Fuente has been out front to not put all of his chips on the table when it comes to high school players. And because of that, uh, and also the fact that the way they tabulate where your recruiting class ranks is based a lot on numbers. It's a cumulative effect. And the year before the Hokies had nine seniors, so they clearly weren't going to sign a lot of guys and everyone wanted to drag them through the mud for being down at like 72 or something in the country. And then you look at, you bring in a Khalil Herbert and a Justice Reed, and you didn't have that many holes to fill in the first place. And now to this year, same thing, you know, you look at it, it's ranked 10 or 11th in the ACC, and that's not Virginia Tech standards, but at the same time, you bring in five impact transfers. Tay Daly is going to be a walk onto campus starter from Vanderbilt in the defensive secondary. Uh, you also bring in Jordan Williams from Clemson, who will be a walk on and start defensive tackle uh, in the middle of your defensive line, whereas those freshmen are going to take years to eventually and maybe not in some cases matriculate. So I, I know that they have strides they want to take in terms of high school recruiting, particularly back in the 757 where they used to dominate and have fallen off a bit over the last decade. Uh, but at the same time, I think that they are very forward thinking in terms of roster management, particularly off this COVID year, but also using the transfer portal as a benefit and not always as a negative. Right. And I mean, uh, the transfer portal is not slowing down. I think it's going to be more and more popular. We're going to see recruits every year get in the transfer portal. But looking ahead to 2021, to say it lightly, man, Virginia Tech has a tough schedule. you got to open with North Carolina, a road game against West Virginia. The I believe it's the fourth week of the season. Which games on the schedule are you looking at as the toughest test for the 2021 team? You're right, Zach. You've got that tone setting game against North Carolina, which in all excuse to Virginia is now your biggest rival, honestly, in the Coastal Division because of the resources they've put behind Mac Brown and that program and the way in which they've recruited over the last couple of years. So I think, and again, Miami would like to be in that conversation, but in my opinion, hasn't been consistent enough to be under Manny Diaz, that those are going to be the two favorites in the Coastal Division once it all shakes out and we see what people have coming out of spring and fall camp. So you love that. TV loves that. That's why you make that matchup in week one, right? Uh, and for the team that wins it, you love it too uh, because you've already put your biggest rival into the loss column um, and you start your season with a big win. Now the converse of that is if you're the team that loses that game, then the rest of your schedule becomes even more daunting. So, you know, right now in the Virginia Tech weight room, they've got a loop of all the touchdowns and highlights scored by North Carolina last year. And we are seven months away from the season. So, you know, that they're looking to that. The thing that stands out the most to me about Virginia Tech's schedule is how unbalanced it is home and road, where you start with six out of seven at home and then close with four out of five on the road. So what that tells me is you better make hay when the sun shines, to use an expression that we use a lot around here in southwest Virginia, meaning if you don't get off to a strong start to the season, uh, you got at Miami and at Virginia to close the season and you could get clobbered. But if you do get off to a good start to the season and you can carry that momentum onto the road with some confidence, Confidence, then it tilts in your favor. So uh, we're going to know a lot about this team by the time they come back from Morgantown, as you mentioned, in week four. And we'll know even more after Notre Dame comes here a couple weeks later. Right. Yeah, th those are some big games. I'm looking forward to it. But sticking with 2021, we saw Khalil Herbert have pretty much his breakout season last year. Who are some players on this 2021 team that you think are really going to shine and could have their breakout season next year? Well, I think we saw a partial breakout from Amari Barno, who's just one of those physically freakish type athletes. You know, think Javon Curse 
a number of years ago where he's 6'4", 250, but he's twitchy enough where he could probably play safety for a lot of teams. The Hokies moved him from linebacker to defensive end last year, and he led the ACC with 16 tackles for loss, but really didn't have the physical frame to play the position. Of course, they're working on that right now in terms of their offseason strength and conditioning program. I look for him to just be an absolute offense wrecker from the outside. I think he has a big season. I think Jordan Williams, given the opportunity that he didn't get at Clemson, finally shows his potential in the middle of that defensive line. Jamari Connor, I think, should lead Virginia Tech in tackles on the defensive side of the ball. And then on the other side, look for Jaden Payute to break out. He is a monster physically, kind of like what I was just talking about with Barno at the receiver position. Unfortunately, he broke his leg in fall camp last year and never was able to line up uh, on that side of the ball for Virginia Tech. He's one of those just freakish athletes who can just go get the football. Braxton Burmeister, we know what he is here, but nobody knows who he is nationally. I think that changes as well. And this is the last shot for big play Trey Turner to really emerge and become an NFL quality prospect. And I know that he's chomping at the bit to show that. So those would be my three on either side of the ball at this point. All right. So, I mean, you have those players, you have a brutal schedule in terms of road versus away games. I mean, road versus home games and the opening game at UNC based on all this, what do you think the ceiling and or floor could be for the 2021 Virginia tech team? It's a lot wider than normally. You know, normally you're looking at it going nine and three, at worst seven and five, and you kind of know what your opponents, particularly in the Coastal Division, are going to be. Uh, this schedule and this roster, that's a wider range. You know, I can see this team winning double digit games if everything clicks and all those guys that I mentioned do blossom into stars on your roster. But if you have some untimely injuries at position groups where you're thin, which has been a staple, unfortunately, the last couple of years, things could bother them out pretty quickly because there's not any gimme games on the schedule, including ETSU and Richmond. So if you were to lose to North Carolina and then you lose on the road at West Virginia, Notre Dame comes in and bang, you know, you're sitting at two and three and you've got four of your last five on the road. So I shudder to think what the floor is. I don't anticipate that being the case, but in my job, you have to mentally prepare yourself for all eventualities. So not lying to you, Zach, it's anywhere from 10 and two, 11 and one to four and eight, quite frankly. Yeah, and I know we're in February, so that's a long way away. Who knows what happens? There are summer workouts, fall camp. And with COVID still out there, you never know what the season's going to be. But kind of a follow-up question here. You mentioned the Coastal Division, all the competition there now with UNC reemerging. Miami returns to Eric King could be on the upswing. And then I think there's a lot of underrated teams like Georgia Tech that are finally get that finally figured out their coach and has some young players. Why do you think the ACC doesn't get the shake like or the national respect they deserve compared to someone like the SEC where it's it's like SEC dominance narrative? Why do you think the ACC doesn't have that narrative in terms of the depth that they really have? Because they don't have the top level athletic depth that the SEC does. As a representative of the ACC, I can be honest and admit that. You know, you have Clemson right now and a lot of other teams, even the ones you mentioned, North Carolina, Miami, Virginia Tech, the ones that are kind of at that next tier in the ACC looking up are aspiring to Clemson. Whereas you saw it this year, Clemson is still aspiring athletically at times to be as gifted and be as intimidating as some of those SEC teams. It's kind of like the Big Ten in basketball, although physicality matters a lot more in football. Um, so I think it's just because it's true. Unfortunately, yeah, that got clouded a bit back in 2016 when Deshaun Watson was here and Drott Evans was lighting it up and you had some other prolific quarterbacks in the league that kind of were able to put band-aids on some of those blemishes that you had on your rosters. And then once those guys moved on, it deferred back to the way it was. And the SEC is just clearly right now the best conference in college football. Right. Yeah, I just – you know, we, as we cover more and more conferences on the podcast, it's just we cover so many teams. I just feel like there's so many that are overlooked in a bunch of these conferences. But last two questions here, I want to focus on your career and Virginia Tech. I, Blacksburg is on my list of places I want to go for a football game. What makes the environment of Blacksburg Lane Stadium such a unique and famous environment on game days? 
Well, first and foremost, it's the setting. You know, you come up here and it's kind of a small slice of heaven if you get a if you get a good weather day, uh, and you do a lot in September and October, particularly where you see the fall foliage and the stadium resting against the stadium woods, as they're called behind the behind the east stands, and it's just kind of that picture of Americana where you drive down Beamer Way and the tailgating and the people out frolicking and having a great time, and then you have the intimidation. Of of Enter Sandman. You have the tradition, of course, of all the greats that have played here. Uh, you have the small town feel with the big time atmosphere, which is what makes most college football outposts that are famous and, and have all that tradition so special. And I put Blacksburg right up there with any of them, uh, you know, not having been the representative of most of them at this point. So, uh, you know, like we said, we talk about environments. One of the things that holds the ACC back is there aren't as many, you know, Florida State's great. Clemson's great. Uh, some of the other teams, though, you can clearly tell it's a notch below. Maybe they're basketball schools. North Carolina Stadium, not that great. Duke Stadium's not that great. Boston College Stadium's not that great. Not picking on them. I'm sure they'd love to upgrade. And Virginia Tech just kind of had the benefit of a larger stadium in a smaller place done a long time ago when it was a lot cheaper to do. Right. And I think you see the stadium races, the football facility races. I mean, uh, I graduated from Auburn. They just they're spending like 90 million on a football facility now, which is just an outrageous amount of money. Last question here, man. You've been the voice of the Hokies since 2015. You've called some great, exciting games. I'm sure you've covered a lot more in your career. What has been your favorite, most memorable call in the booth since you've been doing Virginia Tech football? I think you have to go back a couple of years in the Commonwealth Cup um, to actually three seasons now to 2018 when Virginia Tech ultimately, when they lost the bowl, suffered their first losing season since 1992. At the time, they had held the Commonwealth Cup, which is the trophy between them and Virginia for 14 straight years. And Virginia came to Blacksburg and it looked like they were the better team and they should have won. And honestly, they probably should have. They completely outplayed Virginia Tech for most of the second half. And that game ultimately goes to overtime. There were a couple of improbable catches made downfield and some flukish type plays that kept Virginia Tech there. But then you get into overtime the Hokies kick a field goal uh, Virginia gets the ball second and Virginia Tech's defense was just decimated by injury and youth and whatever else was the problem on the defensive side of the ball that year and Bryce Perkins just inexplicably muffed the snap and fumbled the football and it turned into a walk-off win and probably when you're sitting there thinking we're a snap away from just absolute sorrow here in Blacksburg and my call was uh, probably a little pitchy <laughs> and I said you know, the cup is going nowhere Mikey, that's Mike Burnup, who's my Hall of Fame broadcast partner. And that's the one that's kind of uh, lived on in infamy, I guess, here uh, in Hokie Nation. Of course, my predecessor, Bill Roth, had countless moments like that uh, in his 27 years. Right. And I mean, Virginia Tech is one of my like favorite programs to watch on TV and stuff like that. The uniforms are great. The stadium's great. The atmosphere is always amazing there. Uh, I got a Virginia Tech jersey right there on my wall behind me. So, uh, secretly a little Virginia Tech fan in me, I guess. But, man, you do so many things. You call the games. Where can our listeners find you on social media? Where can they listen to the broadcast? And then just anything else you want to plug here, man, I'm going to give you your time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just on Twitter and the gram, I think, as the kids call it. Uh, both are at Lays, L-A-Z-E-V-T. There are no Zs in my name, but it's very hard to spell if you don't know me, <laughs> which most people <laughs> don't. Uh, so I just made it simple how it sounds. So, yeah, just at Lays VT on either one of those. Uh, you can also check me out at Cameo these days, I guess. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I feel a little bit awkward doing those, but the fans seem to enjoy it. So I've created a profile there. And I do have to say, I noticed the Michael Vick jersey hanging up there behind you. We appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And also, I, I really like that Cadillac Williams jersey you got going there as somebody who used to live in Montgomery, Alabama myself. Yeah, um, I'm originally from Mobile. I graduated from Auburn in 2018, so got a rep my Auburn Tigers. I got another jersey coming in in the mail. I'm waiting for it. But, um, yeah, Michael Vick, growing up, one of my favorite players to watch. And so when I had a chance to get a jersey that he signed, and he even signed it to uh, the first-round pick and the year and everything on it. So I, I, there was a deal I could not pass up there. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, keep up the great work with the podcast. And uh, my pleasure to be with you anytime. For sure. But guys, that is a wrap on our ACC in 28 days for Virginia Tech. Make sure to go follow John Laser on everything. Y'all know where to find us. It's been scrolling across the bottom. Y'all tune in 
to check out this episode. And tomorrow we have Notre Dame punter Jay Bramlett to end our honorary ACC in 28 days. But, guys, we'll be back soon. But for right now, we are out.